To get started on the rendering side of Blender, we're going to start by looking at the Blender internal render engine, simply because it is the default engine. And then after that, we'll look at the Cycles render engine. And we're going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm just going to give you just enough to get up and going and on your feet. And we're going to start by looking at the, the lighting in the Blender internal so that we can have a scene that's actually ready to render. Then we're going to switch over to the materials and textures, look at the environment or world settings, and then finally we'll bounce back and look at some of the actual render settings themselves. So first of all, in our same sample car scene here, the first thing that I want to do is to set up some very, very basic lighting. So I'm going to just add in a lamp object, either going to the add menu, or by pressing Shift A over the viewport, and we can see our lamps down here. Blender Internal has five different kinds of lamps available, the point, sun, spot, hemi, and an area light. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and grab just a hemi light to get us started, or actually, you know what, we'll do a sunlight. And then we'll add it into the scene, and the sunlight, as you might expect, is just a directional light that uh, does not care about position, merely the orientation of the light, so I might just go ahead and just rotate this around like so, and then maybe from the top view, I'll also rotate it over here such that we have just a basic shadow going this way. I'm also just going to move it over just to give a better visual representation of where it's at. So this is our basic light in the scene, and we can find any of our light settings via the light properties or object data panel here. And we've got, uh, from here, we can change this same light over to any other type of light. You know, if we added in a Hemi, then we could simply change it over to a sun if we wanted. In here, we have several different things. Number one, we have the color of the light, we've got the energy, whether it's a negative lamp to actually subtract energy, whether it should work only on this layer or the layer as indicated down here that the lamp is on. Uh, one thing I haven't talked about is I haven't talked too much about these actual layers. It's just a very simple layer management system. But just quickly note that the dot represents that there is an object on that layer, and the yellow dot means that your selected object is on that layer. Um, so then we can restrict that to, or we restrict the light to only the layer that it's on. We can re enable specular or diffuse shading or both. And then in the case of the sunlight, we can go ahead and enable the sky uh, and atmosphere for this light. So if we enable this, then we'll actually get a environment in here. And we do have several different presets here that we can adjust. And we can adjust any of the other sun settings, such as the turbidity, brightness, spread, etc. So if we wanted to just render this real quick, just to get up and going really quickly, we can just bounce right back over to the render settings and we have render image right here. Now we're gonna go and look at all of these settings here in a moment or at least breeze through them. But the, you know, the two most important ones simply are the resolution here and then of course the actual render button. Uh, if you're rendering a still, we have image. If you're rendering an animation, it's just animation here and you can find your animation frame range here along with down below in the viewport. So if we just click render image, it will render from our active camera, which by the way, the active camera in the case that you have multiple, I believe I mentioned this in the previous video, but you can find it here under the scene settings. So right now it is building the ray tree and getting ready to render. Uh, and I have some other settings in here since this was a default or not a default scene that is probably contributing to this. And in this case, you can see that I actually have ambient occlusion enabled. So this kind of talks about the environment or world settings. So let's just bounce over and look at those real quick. We can find our world settings here, and this is for all of the environment. Oh, actually, you know, I don't have uh, ambient occlusion, but you can find those right here. So we have ambient occlusion, whether it's add or multiply mode. We've got our basic environment lighting, which we can either set as just white, as the sky color, uh, which is this here, not the sun sky, and then also a sky texture if we wanted to load an actual texture, such as an HDRI map or something like that into our environment. Uh, we also do have indirect lighting, uh, which unfortunately only works with the approximate method, and this just allows us to have uh, mesh emission sources and have that light bounce around. It does not unfortunately work with the actual lamp objects themselves, uh, the Blender internal engine is fairly limited as far as its uh, physical based um, effects, but the Cycles render engine does uh, all of that very nicely. So both options between Cycles and Blender internal, both of them are generally good for doing different things and are both readily available for whatever you want to do. 
So then lastly, we do have the uh, the Galler and, or method for the ambient occlusion and environment lighting between ray trace and approximate. And then we also have mist and stars if you wanted to add these in. Uh, they're a little bit more just a quick, dirty effect, but can you know serve some purpose at some point in time. So if we just enable our ambient occlusion and environment lighting and we were to render this again, you can also render either from the render panel here or right pressing F12. So just hitting F12, we'll restart that render. You'll also notice that when we rendered, our viewport immediately switched and is now a UV image editor. And this is basically a temporary one where if I were to, first of all, I can cancel my render by hitting escape and that will cancel it. And then if I hit escape again, it'll go back to my 3D view. And you can change this render behavior by going to the render properties and you can find display to be either image editor, full screen, new window, or simply keep UI and render in the background if you don't have an image editor up. By default, it's just set to render here. So if I just turn this uh, resolution down just to 50%, which by the way, when you slide these, if you hold down control, you can lock to increments of 10%. So if I render this real quick, then I can see what we'll get. Um, right now, obviously, we don't have much in our scene. We just have our car and our light. So let's real quickly just look at some very, very basic shaders. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail in here because really the intent for this is merely to get you up and going on your feet. So there we go. We can see that our ambient occlusion, of course, is way blown out. Uh, so I'm just going to actually go ahead and disable these or actually we'll just turn them way down for the time being. Okay, something like that. All right, so if we select any one of our objects, then we can go over to the material properties here, and this is where we'll then add in our materials. So this will work on the selected object, and you can add a new material. You can see that we have a material slot here. So these are our various material slots. We can add new slots or remove slots like this. We can also copy materials, paste materials, or copy materials to any other objects that we have selected. So if I have one slot here, I can simply, first of all, choose any existing materials that I have or just create a new one and we can then name it. We have several different material types between surfaces, wireframe rendering, a volumetric rendering or rendering of halos. Uh, we've got our basic diffuse and specular settings here for diffuse, uh, intensity, color, you name it. You know, we can just give this a nice deep red. Our specular shader here, again, we can change the color. Very, very simple, um, easy to adjust materials, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a scan line and it's not physically based. And so if you want realistic results with the Blender internal, uh, you just really need to know, know, know the settings in and out and uh, be able to tweak it to get exactly what you want. But it can also be very, very good for getting more approximated effects or stylized effects. Uh, we do have several different shader types for Diffuse and Specular, including Lambert, Ornair, Toon, Minart, and Fresnel. Same thing for the Specular shader model. So we might switch over to, say, a Ward ISO shader. We can then adjust our slope very quickly. We do have our material preview here, which you can change the, the type of object that you're previewing on to try and give you a better idea. We do have several sh shading options down here between emit, how much ambient light should it receive if there is any in the world, uh, basic translucency, whether we want a shadeless um, material, tangent shading. We've got our transparency settings here. You can simply enable it and then choose the type of transparency you wish to use between mask, Z transparency, and ray traced transparency within all of the various settings here for index of refraction and whatnot. Uh, next, we've got our mirror options for reflectivity. So enabling this will then give us our reflectivity. We can just hide all these just to get a little better view here. So if we increase our reflectivity, you can see it approximated here. Uh, we've got our Fresnel color of the reflection. So if we want to give it more of a tinted reflection, uh, the depth for ray tracing. So, you know, increase the depth is going to give you higher quality and then whether to make it a glossy shade or not. So at one, it's going to be perfectly reflective. And then the lower you bring this, the softer or, or uh, blurrier your reflections will be. Uh, you do have the samples here as well to increase the quality. And then lastly, or not, well, not lastly, but uh, most importantly, we do also have a subsurface scattering model that you can use uh, with various different presets and then all of the settings here to adjust that. And then finally, also strand settings uh, if you're doing particle hair rendering uh, for grass or hair or for fur or anything like that. 
And then at the bottom here, we have two different panels for shadows and options. Basically, is it detectable by ray tracing? Uh, is it going to use full oversampling? Is it uh, rendering with zero uh, alphas such that the sky background will stay in place? A um, few other settings in here just to finalize things. If you're doing a lot of game art, you may find either face textures or vertex color paint to be beneficial so that you can apply the vertex colors of your mesh to the material to influence the colors. And then lastly, on shadows, we do also have the ability to receive shadows, receive transparent shadows, whether it should only cast shadows and not be visible, and then also whether to be shadows only. So those are the basic materials. Um, if you want to, say, add multiple materials or assign different materials to different parts of your mesh, you can simply add a second material. And we're just going to choose, say, the same one. And then you can immediately see that we have uh, a two right here. That means basically that we have two different objects or materials referencing this data. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this data uh, in one of the next chapters, but for the time being, if you want to duplicate this, because right now these are using the exact same uh, material data, and so if I change one, it'll change both, but if I click the two, that will duplicate it into a new material, I could rename it, do whatever I wanted, maybe we'll just set this to blue to make it clear which one's which, and then if I wanted to, say, assign the blue to a part of my mesh in here, I could just select the object, hit tab to go into edit mode, select the pieces that I wish to assign, Say something like this. And that'll be close enough for demonstration purposes. And then I can simply click select the material that I want and click assign. And that will immediately change it over. And you can do this with as many material slots as you wish. Uh, and you can assign to individual faces within your mesh. So just be sure you select the face, click assign on the material that you want, and then you're good to go. You can also use this to select so as more advanced selections or anything like that also works quite quickly. If I were to switch this into vertex mode, that would fill in the rest of those selections and I could go ahead and assign those as well to give me a slightly more complete model. And in fact, maybe just select all of those there, click assign, and there we have it. So pretty quick, easy uh, material assignment to multiple things. Let's now go ahead and take a look at textures real quick. So if you wanted to you know, influence your diffuse color via a image map or anything like that, you can go over to the textures panel. And so basically think of this as a hierarchy where first we have our materials, then we have our textures. And we've got same same slots here as we have with materials. So we can simply click new to add a new one. And then we can use anything from any of our various procedural textures or a image map. So in this case, let's just assume that we want an image map. Uh, I'm not going to cover any of the procedural textures, but they're there if you want them. Uh, since the, you know, most of the time you're going to be worried about using image maps, I'll just cover that really quickly. So using an image, uh, we can then see our preview here. We can go ahead and load in any image that we want. In this case, I don't have any in here. Um, and so, well, actually I do have one here. So I'll load in that image real quick, uh, one of the original covers, uh, renders of this DVD. And then what I want to do in order to make sure that it's mapped to the UV coordinates, since that's generally what we're going to be doing, the one thing that we need to do is just go down here under the mapping panel and change the coordinates from generated, for generated texture coordinates, to UV. You can also find any number of other settings, such as image sampling, you know, whether it's creating MIP maps, if it's a normal map, uh, how to handle the alpha of the image. Our image mapping itself is just for things like clipping, extend, you know, how is it going to be treated beyond the bounds of the UVs. Then our actual mapping, as I just showed, if you want to do projection mapping, you also have those. If you have multiple UV channels, you can select your UV channel here. In this case, I actually don't have any, so this won't actually work, but that's all right. And then we have our influence. So if we want to influence just the color, if we want to influence the intensity of the color, our alpha, if so, if we're using an alpha map or something, if we have a, a normal map, then you can enable geometry normal right here and increase or decrease the intensity. And with all of these, you'll see the preview here take effect. So if I were to add, do this, increase this, I can set this to both and then it will show here. So obviously this is not gonna work and that's not the way that I would wanna handle that, but it's there to you know, do as you wish. Uh, you then also have blending modes for between multiple textures and on top of the material. And then lastly, uh, the main thing right in here 
is if you are using a spec map or something like that, you will want to enable RGB intensity so that it knows to read the, the values of light and gray rather than the actual color values and try and convert them. So just how to handle the actual image. So that's it for textures. Uh, it's pretty straightforward if you're using images. The main thing, just remember to load in the image, set your actual image or your actual mapping, and then set your influence like you want. Going back to the material then, you can see it here, uh, or you can also see it here. So I'm just going to remove that though by hitting the X. And if we then render this, it'll take just a moment, uh, but it will pop up and we'll have our various shaders just like we expect with a pretty horrendous render in this case. Um, but just to finalize this real quick preview of the internal render engine, let's just bounce real quick over to the render properties just to go over a couple of these of you know the primary settings that you're going to want to be using or that you'll want access to likely. And number one, uh, we have our uh, the layers I'm going to talk about later, but these are render layers if you want to separate your elements out to other uh, various layers to then work with in post-production. Uh, we've got obviously our render dimensions like I already talked about. We do have various render presets for many of the common formats. Uh, we've got our anti-aliasing controls between 5, 16, or full sample. If you want to, if you need to solve some compositing problems or and get extra aliasing. We do also have a uh, sampled motion blur for motion blur for animations and such. It's not great, but it can work for, for some cases. For the shading, we can just very quickly enable or disable many aspects of the shading pipeline, such as if you want to disable all textures or shadows at render time, then you can do this quite quickly. Uh, for under the performance tab, we do have you know the number of threads the render should be using, the number of tiles that we're going to be rendering. So right now it's eight by eight. Whether to save the, save the render to the buffer, uh, free image textures every time that you are compositing. So this is mostly for compositing right in here uh, using the node-based compositor that I'm going to show you in one of the final chapters. Uh, same thing post-processing. It's basically the same thing whether or not to perform post-processing via the compositor on the final render and or whether or not to apply the sequencer effects uh, via the, the video sequencer in the video editing tab uh, to your final render. So if you're applying, you know, some uh, post-production sequencing effects or doing a video edit, then you can use that. By default, both of these are enabled. And if you do not have any compositing uh, in place or any sequencing in place, then it's just going to ignore them because it basically just checks, does it have compositing or does it have sequencing? If, if yes, perform those. If not, then just ignore it. Uh, fields and then uh, that's about it. If you want to stamp your layers or your renders real quick for render times or anything like that, then you can just enable that, set what you want, or enable a custom note. And then last or last two things, uh, fairly important, are our output. So when we render this, this is merely saved in the buffer. But if we are rendering an animation, then at the end of every frame, it's obviously going to save out that image. So you can define the output here, whether to overwrite, create placeholders, uh, the format that it's using to save directly out to, uh, the amount of compression and or any other encoding settings that you may have. So for example, if you set this to H.264, you're going to have your various encoding settings here as well. Uh, and then below that is the, the baking tab, which I'm not going to talk about just yet. Uh, we'll do that in uh, one of the later videos as well, but it allows you to bake everything from normal maps to textures to mirror intensity and whatnot. So that's the Blender internal render engine. I know that kind of blazed through that real quickly, but hopefully that's enough to get you up on your feet and you know playing with the render engine. Uh, just keep in mind, you know, the main thing you've got your materials over here with multiple uh, materials if you want to blend between them two. If you really want to dive in, we do also have node-based materials. If you just enable this and then switch over to the node editor, you can have node-based materials. Uh, they're not great in the Blender internal engine. Uh, they can be a little troublesome, but they are there if you want to work with them. The same thing is true for textures as well. Uh, you can actually enable a node-based texture, but that again is a topic for another day. So that's it for the Blender internal. Let's now jump over to the Cycles Render Engine.